Okay, folks, uh, we might um, take our seats if we can, and uh, we'll crack into this afternoon session. Hope you enjoyed lunch, and for those online, I hope you got some lunch. Uh, so um, uh, the, uh, the afternoon session is started off uh, with uh, Nikki LeBranch. Uh, Nikki's a research fellow uh, here at the Mining Industry Safety and Health Centre. Um, she's uh, based in the Occupational Health and Safety area, of course, uh, and she's focusing on uh, the managing of particulates. Uh, she's also working in the area of uh, emergency response and incident management. So for those that weren't aware, there was a, a level one exercise recently in central Queensland and, and each year Nikki participates in the organising committee of that. Um, Nikki's currently working on her PhD in, in the area of characterising respirable dust. And um, uh, she's received a uh, OSI double M uh, endowment uh, fund scholarship to complete that. Uh, Nikki's uh, a mining engineer by profession and uh, has worked, uh, has broad experience across the US, Colombia and Australia, working with some um, CIMTARs, uh, BHP and NIOSH before that she uh, saw the light and came to work at the university. Nikki's also a board member of the OSI double M Health and Safety Society and has been extremely, has been an extremely active member uh, of that group um, over the years. Uh, her paper, paper today is uh, a work that she's been um, progressing for the last three years and fits nicely with a lot of the subject matter today and it's characterization of particulates in Australian mines. Thanks, Nikki. Hi, thank you very much, Brett. Um, so I will be talking to you about the, the characterization of particulates uh, here in Australia. Um, and you've heard a, a lot about um, you know, the characterization methodology in general uh, from Emily today and a lot about why that characterization is important from, from Bob this morning. So they've set me up um, pretty well. Um, so I'll start with some of the a comparison of the US and Australian um, coal mine samples. And for those of you that were asking about some of their mining conditions, the, um, the, the first bars are the, um, the US mines. So MCA is mid central Appalachia, northern Appalachia, and then uh, south central Appalachia. Um, and as you can see, here's the, you see the mouse? Um, here's the, the quartz. Uh, they've been having issues uh, with there. Uh, but what you also see is a lot of alumina silicates uh, in those samples. The four samples in the, the red bars are the Australian samples, and these are all for continuous miners. There are a few differences between how we do the mining in the US and Australia. So their continuous miner samples are all from cut and flit up operations. So it's just the continuous miner there whereas we're using the minor bolter operations here in Australia. So you would get the dust generated both from the continuous minor cutting process, as well as the, the drilling process to put in the, the roof bolts. Um, lucky for us, relatively more carbon in the, um, in the samples, that's the, the blue. Uh, the exception to that is mine three, which was cutting a stone band uh, in the section. And so similar to what um, the US has, has found, uh, I'm finding here, is that when you do have any rock in the seam, it is disproportionately showing up in that respirable fraction. Um, and with those, the alumina silicates uh, that are, are showing up in some of the samples, uh, there was um, one study by Abraham in the, the US, so that was one of the, the SUNY um, uh, New York partners that that Bob mentioned. So they looked at a broader cross section of industry of 893 lung tissue samples. Um, and they found more than twice as many alumina silicate particles um, than silica particles in 
the lung tissue biopsy samples that they had. So 37% uh, versus 15%. So it is also something that we need to look out for is how many aluminosilicates are present here. Um, the yellow are the carbonates in here, which is the, um, the, the stone dust or other calcite that's in the seams. Uh, and then there are occasionally heavy metals and other particulates here. Another thing that we talked about earlier is the, um, the size of the particles. And um, the particle size does matter, as well as the, the mineralogy. And not all mines have a uniform particle size distribution. For, so for those um, same four samples I showed you on the last slide, this is the breakout of the, the count versus the volume of the, the particles. Um, so even for the same type of mining process, because of the different seams, um, the, the particle size distribution can vary from mine to mine. So the particles that are less than four microns in size account for between 86 and 98% of the particle size distribution um, but that same size fraction only accounts for between 16% and 67% of the volume. And if you're assuming a, a constant density, that volume is a proxy for, for mass um, of the dust. And it's the mass that you're seeing in the, the gravimetric samples, which is the way we, we currently measure exposure. Um, but as has already been talked about, that not, may not necessarily be indicative of the health hazard uh, that we're facing. And there's other research that's been done previously at NIOSH that shows for pure silica, the, the much smaller, um, finer particles cause much more alveolar macrophage activation than the coarser particles that are at about four microns in size. Um, so th those last two slides of data were um, from the, the beginning of my research where I was sending the, um, the samples to uh, Emily Sarver uh, in the US uh, to do the analysis. But since then, uh, we've developed our own analysis technique here on the uh, Mineral Liberation Analyzer, or MLA. And it's at the Julius Kirschnit Mineral Research Center, or JKMRC, um, which is part of the Sustainable Minerals Institute here. So the MLA is normally used to identify um, minerals in polished sections of drill core or lump material. Um, so analyzing for particulates on filter is a new technique um, for this type of microscope. Uh, it is a different um, type of um, SEM you know, energy, ener with energy dispersive x-ray. So uh, some similarities to the work that was, that's been being done, but also has some other um, cool features. Uh, and I'll show you some of the pictures in those of those um, as I go through. Um, so with the, the MLA, I've been able to identify 26 different mineralogies uh, in the underground coal data, and that's opposed to the, the seven broader mineral categories in the US analysis. And I can also look at particles down to 0.52 microns in size. Um, so I can also determine the, the size distributions for the particular mineral components and see the individual uh, particles and with multiple mineralogies and the microagglomerates. And I'll show you some pictures of, of what those look like in Australian mines in a minute. Um, so starting with the, the mineralogies. So this is data from three underground coal mines analyzed on the, the MLA. Um, so these are three different mines in different seams than what I showed you on that US comparison slide a few slides ago. Um, and I have mineralogy analyzed for 17 of the 28 samples taken and particle size distributions for 11 of the samples uh, as some were too overloaded to get the reliable particle size information. Uh, with these samples, each filter has between 150,000 and 800,000 particles. Um, so that's a total of eight and a quarter million particles analyzed on these filters uh, in my database. Um, so it did take a while initially to get a handle on um, the, the data set just because of the, the wide size of it. Um, but similar to the, the US data, a lot of the, the major trends hold true uh, with relatively more carbon in the samples 
and lucky for us in Australia, mostly a, a relatively small amount of quartz. So what, what's interesting is that uh, these two mines that have high amounts of calcite on the long wall um, mid faces uh, don't have nearly those quantities of calcite coming in the, um, the main gate. And while normally we attribute the, the presence of calcite to the stone dust products being applied, um, I actually reached out to one of the mines to, to talk to them about what stone dusting was, was going on um, on the long wall that I, that I may have missed at the time. Uh, but it turns out there's actually a calcite lens in the cold cleat um, that, that's causing the, the high levels of calcite there. Um, so again, what would be s small parts of what's in the, uh, the seam uh, are reporting in much higher fractions to the, to the respirable fraction. So we were both very surprised to see just how high the, the levels of calcite uh, turned out to be. And then for, for mine seven, for test six and seven, so these were both uh, long wall mid face, but they were done on uh, two different days and show quite a, a different makeup, indicating a lot of variability uh, in that particular seam. Whereas mine eight um, shows incredibly consistent mineralogy throughout the mine. Um, and there's very good agreement between the, the paired samples here. Um, so the, this graph shows the overall particle size distributions um, for, for mine six and eight. And mine six follows the, the trend I'd previously observed in mines one through four, um, which is published in a paper that I'll reference on the last slide. Um, so the, the dashed red line is the continuous minor. And I normally find that that's a, a coarser particle size distribution. Um, and then the red line at the top represents the mid face samples there. Uh, and then the main gate sample in between that. So that's, that's typically what I've been finding uh, in most of the mines. The mine eight, because the mineralogy is um, all um, so consistent throughout, there's really not much variability in that particle size distribution. Um, to be seen. So with this data, you know, overall particle size distribution is great, but I can actually take it down to the level of getting the particle sizes for all the different mineralogies within. So, and, and break it down to that level. Um, so many of the particles are made up of multiple mineralogies, those micro agglomerates that um, Emily has talked about earlier. So for these graphs, I filter the particles by those that are more than 50% by weight of a certain mineralogy. Uh, and then here, the, the muscovite, plagioclase, orthoclase, and kaolinite are all types of aluminosilicates. Um, so I can differentiate the, the different types within and, and see how, how they break out individually. Um, I've also found that the shape of the quartz distribution uh, can be different to some of the other mineralogies. Um, so in the, the right-hand sample here, the quartz starts out um, in the middle of the particle size distributions, but swiftly rises to be one of the, the finest um, PSDs in, in the sample. So what's also interesting is that while mine six had the higher variability in overall particle size distributions in the different areas, the, the mineralogies within tend to have a, a much narrower spread of, of PSDs, while for mine 40, that was the very consistent mineralogy um, overall, the individual mineralogies within actually have a wider spread of particle size distributions. So another thing that can be done with the data is to actually break it out by the, the mineralogy size fractions within. Um, so I've split it up here into particles of less than one micron, one to 2.5, 2.5 to four, and four to 10 microns. And then the right-hand bar is the, the overall particle size. Um, so these samples are mostly carbon by weight percent. So I've cut it off at the 40 and 60% um, to show you more detail of the top half of the graph, but everything uh, below those lines is, is just more carbon. 
Um, so in the first figure, the, the carbon actually um, decreases in the, the first three size fraction and then goes up again in the four to 10 micron size range. Um, and there's also a rise in the percentage of, um, of muscovite in, in the largest size fraction. And um, in the, the second figure, the, the particle size um, just decreases, um, or the, the carbon decreases through the, uh, the particle size ranges. So, and there is, um, so for both samples, calcite has um, slightly, slightly larger percentages of the, the middle uh, size fractions there. So moving to the, the images of the particles, um, the MLA will give you a, a false color image of all the different particles on the filter. Um, so uh, I have, have data like this for all eight, eight and a quarter million of them. Um, so it's um, you know, quite a lot to, to go through and there are some very cool things to, um, to see in there. Um, this is just an example of what some of those particles look like. Um, and this follows on with what Emily was saying about the microagglomerates, where you tend to have a number of particles with, um, you know, with more than one mineralogy in them. Um, so I can see down to 0.52 microns in size. Um, and the pore size of the respirable filters I'm using is 0.45 microns anyway. So there wouldn't really be reliable data uh, below that because you would be losing particles in those size fractions. Um, so there are a variety of shapes of the particles that I'm seeing as well. Um, you've got some that are ovaloid, um, but you've also got many particles that are, um, that are long and narrow and have a higher aspect ratio. Um, so with these particles, I, for the, the individual particles, they're, they're all assigned a number. So I can interrogate them in a number of ways. And they, I get a spreadsheet of parameters. So the, the normal uh, parameters that you'd get would include area, perimeter, max span, length, uh, breadth, and then a calculation of density, which is based on the, the various mineralogies. Uh, and this gives you a, a weight percentage for them. So here's some examples of, of some of these particles on the filter uh, that I'm seeing um, that have the more complex mineralogies. Um, and the number beside them are the areas for those mineralogies. So you can see just how much um, of each mineralogy, each particle uh, accounts for and, and the variety of, of different mineralogies that are made up of the microagglomerates. The other thing I can look at is um, there's a number of ways to sort them and particle max span is one of them. And this normally filters out your um, your elongate mineral particles or your fibers. So you can take a look at, at them. Um, it was interesting to me to see that in this particular sample, um, your, your needle-like fibers include kaolinite, carbon, calcite, and calcium silicate, and even an unknown particle. So it's not just one mineralogy that's, that's showing up um, in, in the needle-like fiber category. Uh, the other one that's very interesting that um, Stephen Smythe was ask asking about earlier is the, the carbon particles. And while um, this technique can't determine uh, the difference between the, the carbon and DPM uh, at this point, the DPM does have the unique shape um, that you can pick up on the SEM field manually. Um, so you, in this, the photo at the bottom right, you can see um, some of the, the wispy little particles uh, that are the, the diesel, whereas the, the black dots are the, um, the 0.45 micron size particles or 0.45 micron holes in the, the filter. Um, but you can start to look at the shape and see what's most likely diesel and what's most likely uh, coal particles, um, you know, based on those funny fluffier um, shapes for lack of a better word. Um, that, that are the agglomerated diesel. Um, so it's, then there, there are particles in the middle, which you can't really tell one way or the other, but you can definitely see some that, that look um, very strongly like diesel based on the, 
on the shape. Um, and the, the size range actually varies quite considerably in these. So it's not the less than one or 0.8 microns that um, we'd normally think of as diesel particulates. So they are agglomerating. Um, what we don't know is, at this point is whether this agglomeration took place on the filter, in the cyclone, um, or if it was picked up like that through agglomeration in the air at the mine. Um, but if it was, agglomerated in the mine air or in the cyclone, um, that would suggest that our normal measurements um, with the, the cascade impactor cutting off at, at one micron would be underestimating the, the diesel uh, we're actually getting. So I think it would be important for the future um, to be able to distinguish between the coal and diesel. So this is one of the things getting added to the to-do list. So if you're interested in a PhD, please let me know. Um, there's a very interesting project here in it. Another thing we found on the, um, the filters is some particles with an iron chromium nickel content, um, which the MLA has most closely identified as resembling stainless steel. Um, so that wasn't something I was expecting to find uh, in the samples. And that the fraction of stainless steel only varied from 0.02 to 1.1% of these samples, which you know, is not very much on a percentage basis, um, but considering you know, how many particles there are, this is still about 26,000 um, particles of stainless steel that I've found. Uh, and there's no obvious correlation between the amount of carbon and the amount of stainless steel in the samples, um, but with coal as well as diesel, in there, um, you know, it, it can be hard to differentiate. Um, but in talking to the mines, there's no stainless steel equipment used in the mines that they could identify uh, as the source. And it's been theorized they might be coming uh, from the diesel engines themselves. Um, so we do know that there are iron chromium and iron chromium nickel particles found in lung tissue that are markers for welding fume exposure. Um, but Australian coal mines don't allow hot work underground. Um, and it's not just the underground mines though. Um, I'm also finding some of the stainless steel on surface locations that are close to vehicle traffic. Um, so this is something that needs to be further investigated into the potential sources of, of why this is in our uh, respirable samples. So if you have any thoughts, um, please feel free to talk to me later on this one. So I hope this, this presentation has given you an appreciation uh, for the types of information uh, that can be gained from the dust characterization and the potential that it has to revolutionize our understanding. Uh, so I, there is a comparative analysis underway of the Virginia Tech and MLA methodologies, uh, which means I should also have MLA data uh, with this next level of detail for mines one through four um, as well. Um, so several of those samples have already been analyzed um, and show good relative agreement so far. And then there's another set in the lab um, awaiting analysis to complete this comparison. And I expect those results to be published um, sometime in 2022 when I come back from maternity leave. Um, and there are, have also been sampling campaigns undertaken at um, four metals mines, so including smelters and processing plants um, in Australia so far. And this data is proving even more interesting than the, the coal data. Um, so there's about 40 different um, mineralogies present in those samples as opposed to the, the 26 um, in, in the coal. Um, my mat leave replacement, uh, Lucy Bishno, is actually out right now um, at a mine sampling uh, this week. So there'll be more to come. Um, but there is also PhD in this, if anyone would, would like to take that up as a, as a topic. Um, and so, and I should mention too, with uh, Graham's presentation earlier, I can look at the pyrite and the chalcopyrite as two of the, um, the, the mineralogies that are finding, which do exist in the coal in, in some fractions, but of course, much more in, in, in the metals mines. Um, I'm also collecting inhalable samples 
um, as well. And I can compare the inhalables to the respirables um, for the different methodologies. And it's interesting to see how, um, how the mineralogies change uh, from one size fraction to another and what's being picked up. Um, so far, I've tried three different inhalable techniques uh, and I'm looking to standardize uh, an inhalable methodology there. So there is further sampling planned for next year for underground metals mines and underground coal mines, which will expand the, the database um, of all the mineralogies um, and build on our understanding of what is actually in our dust in the underground coal mines and uh, in Australia. Um, so if you're, if you're at a mine and you're interested, please contact myself, David Cliff, or Brett Garland to, to talk more about um, doing some sampling there. So we're also talking to other parts of industry like quarries, surface mines, engineered stone bench top cutting operations about the potential opportunities for characterization there. Um, and this would help expand the, the dust database and provide valuable information on the dust characteristics um, that are faced by some of the other industries. Um, this is also very potentially useful information for dust control uh, methodologies. So for instance, for the, um, the, the long walls that I showed in uh, at the slide at the beginning, um, either we're doing a really good job targeting the coal uh, already, or the coal just isn't there in some of the, the size fractions. So you'd get more bang for your buck at this point, trying to start targeting um, some of the other mineralogies uh, that, that are present. And you, you also saw on a previous slide, how the, the different size fractions change too. Um, so you could also look to, to more specifically target the, the size fractions that your different processes are generating. Um, and I hope this data can be used to inform the health related um, dust work as well. And some of that, that lung tissue work um, going on uh, and to see the differences between the, the, the pure crushed coal samples and those microagglomerates of the variety of mineralogies that we're seeing. Um, so as you can see from the, the data presented today, um, not all coal dust is coal, and there are several sources of dust within the mines, uh, and the particle size distributions of the dust do change based on where in the mine that you're mining and the equipment being used. Um, so there, there are synergies in combining the, the characterization and the lung tissue work. Um, so the, at the bottom of the slide here is the information for the, the paper um, that's been published on the mine one through four data. I expect the, the mine six through eight data to be published in the next few months. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nikki. Any questions for Nikki? I think the major thing out of Nikki's research is that it started off to be a gap analysis um, to see what we didn't know and the size, the shape, and what was actually uh, what the characteristics of the, the minerals were as the uh, as the end result. So once you start to understand that, you can start to look at prevention uh, and understand uh, what it's doing in the lungs. So that's it's vital research and it's vital that we continue the work. Thank you, Andrew Batterson. Any thought given to doing analysis and comparing surface mines with underground mines? Couple of questions online. First of all, there's a question from an anonymous attendee who asks particularly about diesel particles being picked up in your monitoring, where they picked up underground. And do you have any thoughts on diesel particulate filters? I showed on the, the MLA slides, that was all picked up underground. Uh, I have not done any diesel um, comparisons that to date yet to look at um, 
to, I haven't done any diesel comparisons to date to look at what's actually being picked up um, by the, the, the diesel um, sampling heads, which typically here in Australia, we're using the SKC heads with the cascade impactor that cuts off at, at one micron. So it would be very interesting to try and, um, and see what we're getting carbon wise uh, from one versus the other. Uh, keeping in mind that the, the limitations of the MLA technique is only what's down to the, the 0.52 mm -hmm. microns. Uh, Samar Amari, thank you, for, thank you for your presentation and ask, were you able to measure and characterize nano size diesel particulate matter? No, um, just because the, the 0.52 is the, the limit of the MLA and with the, the filters that we're using, uh, we do have the potential to lose things uh, less than 0.45 through the holes in the filter. And Peter Knott says, lots of work in here. <laughs> particle size distribution. Uh, he asks, um, the particle size distribution measurements are only done on samples collected through a respirable cyclone. So therefore it's a subset of the airborne dust. What is the uncertainty of measurement in your particle size distribution estimates? And are the particle sizes you're talking about aerodynamic diameters? Uh, so they are not aerodynamic diameter. They are actual uh, physical measurements of the particle diameter. Um, yes, the cyclones do have a, uh, their own cutoff. So the, the cyclone that you're using, um, so for all the MLA data uh, presented here, those are the Casella respirable cyclones. Whereas the first couple slides with the US comparison was previously using the SKC uh, sampling heads. Um, the way to solve that issue is the, um, that comparison of the inhalable samples to the respirable samples, uh, because the inhalables will give you, that doesn't filter the, the particle size at all. So that gives you all of the, the particles that are present um, in the air. Well, thanks for that. And uh, again, congratulations, Vicky, uh, on that. And thank you very much for the talk. Cheers. The next presenter today uh, is Dr. Yingying Sun. Uh, before I even start to uh, do this, I'm going to apologise because this is a, this is a mouthful, and. Uh, there's some words here that'll take me about five goes to get right. So uh, Dr. Sun is a researcher based at the University of New South Wales at the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Dr. Sun is an expert in redox, metals induced inflammatory, oxidative stress in relation to the progressive, uh, the progression of new, neurodegenerative disorders and lung injury. Dr. Sun uh, was initially trained as a water engineer and geochemist specializing in pollutant transformation and degradation. Dr. Sun expanded her interest in redox metal related oxidative stress uh, with an increasing focus on human health implications and potential therapeutic strategies. She excels in investigating fundamental biochemical mechanisms and predicting long-term long -term health impacts by using numerical models, statistical analysis, and interpretation and biomedical imaging techniques. Dr. Sun's uh, presentation today is titled Elucidation of the Immune System Response to Inhalable Coal Dusts. So hopefully Dr. Sun's online. Oh yes, I'm here. Thank you. And if you could share your screen, uh, Dr. Sun, then uh, uh, welcome to University of Queensland and the screen's yours. Okay. So if you just go to presentation mode for yours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm more glad that I have the chance here to share my recent results. My talk today is about the immune system response to the inhalable coal dust. In particular, I would like to explore whether certain chemical composition of coal dust can induce more severe or acute immune response 
and result in greater acute damage to the immune system. This work was undertaken at the University of New South Wales, primarily by Dr. Andrew Casilla and myself. Uh, this project was led by Professor David Waite. Uh, this is an outline of my talk. I will provide some very brief background to the, uh, to the project first, especially why we are interested in the immune response to the inhibable coal dust. After this, I will move on to the sample preparation and our biological results. Then I will go through our interpretation from a fundamental perspective, especially the potential impacts on the antioxidant defense system. After this, I will finish up with a summary, including the implications and limitations of our results and where we are heading to next. As mentioned by previous talks, we all know that the composition of coal and the surrounding minerals are complicated, and it varies depending on the location of the mines. A variety of different components present in the coal dust may trigger the lung disease. And this includes the reduced iron minerals, crystalline silica, silicates, carbon, or other redox active metals. For all types of elements, particle size is a crucial factor. As the figure shown on the right, Smaller particles are capable of penetrating into deeper section of the lung, and the ultrafine fraction, like those with a diameter less than 0.1 microns, are potentially be transported to other organs, like the heart or brain. While these components have been shown to play a role in the lung disease, other lifestyles, such as smoking, may also be a factor for the disease progression. Over the past decades, the major toxic components for CWP, such as carbon, silica, or iron, is under hard debate. While all the potentials will be covered in this talk, more attention will be given to the role of reduced iron and silica. In addition to the inflammation arising from the cellular response shown in the middle of the slide, extracellular oxidants can be produced by both reduced iron minerals and silica. As shown on the left side, oxidants can be produced when the unbearing dust are exposed to the dissolved oxygen in the lung. This will facilitate the production of reactive oxygen species. As indicated by the name, these species, such as the hydroxyl radicals shown here, are very uh, reactive and they can damage the cell membrane or even the DNA of the cells. This may lead to the depletion of cellular antioxidants and eventually results in the fibrosis or scars and probably lead to the characteristic forms of lung disease such as CWP. As shown on the right side, the same pathways are possible for freshly cleaved silica particles as well. While the major toxic component is still controversial, there is a general consensus that CWP is strongly correlated to the chronic lung inflammation, which may eventually lead to the lung fibrosis. In general, there are several cell types involved in the dust-related lung dysfunction. Among these cells, the epithelial cells, macrophages, and the fibroblasts are most frequently studied cell lines. Each of the cell lines has their unique functions. For example, the epithelial cells are the first line of contact of dust and the fibroblasts are more related to the fibrosis and the scar formation. As shown on the bottom right, in addition to their unique function, all the cells resident in the lung will talk to each other when they identify foreigners, such as the bacteria or particles. Their communication are presumably while the production of cytokines or chemicals. However, in this work, we only focus on the interaction between coal dust and the macrophages. This cell line represents one of the immune cells, and they actively eat foreign particles in the lung. The phagocytic process, which is actually the eating process of the macrophages, could reflect the well-acknowledged inflammation process after dust inhalation. As shown on the left, once the dust is eaten by the macrophages, they will be transported into a small vesicles here. This white scale has a very low pH and it is enriched with various oxidants, 
produced by the mitochondria. Theoretically, the dust are expected to be cleared by these oxidants. This process is of particular biological meaning in terms of the inflammation, and it is crucial for the differentiation of the role of redox metals and other components such as carbon or silica. One of the reasons is that the virus oxidants produced by the macrophages that shown on the top of the slides here could uh, amplify the toxicity arising from the redox metals, such as reduced iron minerals. So moving on to the samples used in this work. The samples were provided by our core industry partners across Australia. All the samples were well wrapped before shipped to us in order to produce a freshly made material. All the samples were grounded by the ball mill and sieved by using a cascade impactor to a size range that can actually eaten by the macrophages before storing them in the chamber. As shown in the figure on the bottom right, more than 90% of the dust are less than 10 microns, and more than 50% of them are less than 4 microns. This is a diameter frequently reported to be detrimental for both airborne particulates and the occupational dust. We all know that both silica and reduced N minerals are potential toxic components within the dust. In this work, we try to visualize the subtle toxicity of, the, of these two elements first. Artificial stones were used in this work to represent the pure silica sample. The photo on the top right shows the macrophages used in this work. Uh, before addition of the dust, the nuclei of these macrophages were stained by a fluorescence probe. This probe will have a green color after excitation. However, this color will be quenched and disappear when the cell membrane is damaged. So from this perspective, this color is a good indicator for the integrity of the cell membrane. From the quantitative uh, studies shown on the top left, we know that both silica and iron bearing coal dust can cause damage to the macrophages and a greater damage was observed from dust containing higher iron content at any time intervals. This results indicated that though both elements showed cell toxicity, which means the increase in the cell dies, uh, an unbearing coal dust may induce greater acute damage to the cells, especially within the first 24 hours. This acute damage may arise from its damage to the cell membranes. As shown in the photos on the right side, we can clearly see that both silica and coal dust were it by the macrophages as the cells change to black uh, from the clear shining dots here. However, when we compare the results from uh, physical contrast and the fluorescence imaging, the green fluorescence was completely disappeared in higher and barring samples shown on the bottom, and the color was still visible for those has less iron content or crystal silica shown above. Uh, with this more acute toxicity in mind, we expand our investigations into more samples and include the assessment of the production of cytokines. The cytokines we measure in this work is the TNF alpha, which is one of the most potent pro-inflammatory cytokines released by the macrophages. As shown in the pie charts, samples used in this work represent a great variation in the elemental compositions. As shown uh, in the top right figure here, the addition of these samples to the macrophages resulted in a cell dysfunction to different extent. And correspondingly, the figure uh, below it showed an increase in the production of the, uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokines within the same time period. Compared with the control group, which is the one that doesn't have any dust in it, and our first sample here, which has marginal iron content in it, more cytokines were produced from the other four samples. So this is especially the case for the third one here. This one uh, has more iron content shown in the pie chart, and a greater cell dysfunction shows here. 
to further explore the relevance of elemental composition in acute toxicity induced by virus dust, we conducted a regression between different elemental content and the cell viability measured after 24 hours. The figures on the bottom uh, of the slides indicated that a relative moderate correlation was evident between the availability of macrophages and total ion content, which is here. And no constant correlation with carbon and crystalline silica were evident in this short-term study. Uh, despite this, we should be aware that these results only represent acute toxicity from the dust, which may not be capable of representing any chronic impact. Given all the evidence mentioned above, we further examine the relevance of the ferroproptosis to the cell damage observed in prior slides. The reason for this is that we don't want to underestimate the impact of any potential toxic element on the progression of CWP. This is very detrimental to the miners. Briefly, the ferroptosis reference re the toxicity specifically induced by iron. Its key characteristics include enhanced lipid peroxidation and an alleviation of cytotoxicity by ion and antioxidants. So in this work, we further examine the effectiveness of both ion and antioxidants on the survival rate of the macrophages. Lipid peroxidation was not further explored as the image results shown in previous slides already visualized a greater membrane damage induced by samples with greater ion content. We would like to use ion chelators to clarify the relevance of ferroptosis because these chelators can lock reactive ion into the inert complex. And this prevents the potential interaction with other species, such as the coexisting metals or the oxidants produced from the aging process. As shown on the bottom right, the long antioxidant defense system includes the low weight molecules, enzymes, and metal binding proteins. These antioxidants can react with various oxidants produced in the lung to form non toxic products. In this work, we will only focus on the low weight antioxidants, as these molecules can better differentiate the role of redox metals and other toxic components, such as silica. Here, we choose a clinically used ion chelator defarapry to assess the efficiency. As shown in the figures on the left, we can see that minimum alleviation was evident for the sample with marginal reduced N minerals, both at the beginning and at the end of the experiment. By contrast, significantly and statistically enhanced the survival rate of macrophages were observed for the rest of the samples continue reduced N minerals. As the chelator works specifically for iron, the difference observed in the left figure indicates that the iron should play a role in the dust induce acute toxicity to the macrophages. This effectiveness may be cause of the interaction between the chelator with both surface and aquarius iron, which reduce the likelihood of the production of cell damaging radicals and probably contribute to the protection of cell membranes shown in the imaging. Similar to the effects observed for the ion chelator, addition of antioxidant GSH resulted in a more significant and a statistical increase in the availability of the macrophages when the cells were exposed to dust containing more ion minerals. Despite this, we can see that the efficiency shown on the left figure uh, is independent of ion content. And this indicated that the mineralogy of this element also influenced its reactivity. So to further explain and clarify the complicated processes, we developed a numerical model to assist the understanding of relevant role of ion minerals. In general, the model consists of various elemental reactions and these reactions might be involved in the uh, process. If the model prediction, which are the solid lines shown on the, uh, in the figures here, uh, if, if the lines shown here can fit well to the experimental data, which are the symbols here, that means 
uh, the model we developed here may be capable of describing what happened in the experiment. So to simplify, I only show the key interactions in this schematic here. From the experimental and the numerical studies, we can conclude that the presence of iron released from the dust enhanced the consumption of long antioxidant up to tenfold and significantly weakened the antioxidant defense system of the lung. This can be seen from the rapid decrease of GSH shown in the top right when iron is present. Also, the presence of water-soluble antioxidants such as the GSH, they can facilitate the iron cycling and assist in maintaining more and in the label and pool. This can also be seen from the figure on the bottom right. So moving on to the final slides, uh, we are able to note that the reduced N minerals may initialize acute inflammation. And this probably will enhance the production of pro-inflammatory infl uh, pro cytokines. Also, the iron content correlates with declining macrophages viability. This is highly possible while the ferroportosis pathways. And iron cycling can significantly weaken the low antioxidant defense system. However, it is important to recognize the limitations of this study. Although monoculture and the short-term uh, studies are the most commonly used method to measure the particle toxicity in a laboratory environment, we still should keep in mind and question that how representative these monocultures are. For example, if they can completely explain what is really going on in the lung tissue. Also, how well do these short-term studies represent the chronic lung disease? And also, we, we see that only five samples were used in this work due to time limitation. And uh, more samples should be uh, used to obtain more statistical insights in the near future. In a summary, while these uh, while these results are interesting and worthy of further investigation, we can't simply say the presence of iron minerals will definitely result in lung dysfunction. And likewise, we can't simply say that because we identified a weaker link between cell viability and the silica. The impact from silica is less important than iron. So, uh, in terms of the next step, we will use more representative cells such as the co-culture to mimic the in vivo situation. This will enable us to have a better idea of how important the cell communication will be. Also, we will design long-term biological experiment to study the impact from chronic inflammation. Uh, that's all for my presentation today. So any questions for me? Thank you, Dr. Sun. Uh... Are there any questions from a very detailed presentation? Not from in the room, Dr. Sun, any online at all, Kelly? So, uh, Dr. Sun, uh, there's no questions. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, thank you. I think uh, people are going to need a bit of time to uh, devour what you have um, delivered today and uh, I, I no doubt people will be in contact once uh, they've had a chance to review what you've uh, what you've presented. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and uh, if everyone can just join with me to thank Dr. Sun uh, for the presentation. So our final speaker for today uh, uh, is um, Stephen Smythe. Uh, Stephen commenced his coal mining career in Collinsville in 1988, and he's worked in both the underground and open cut uh, operations. Uh, Stephen uh, has represented his fellow mine workers for over 19 years uh, and currently holds the position as a Queensland District President of the Mining and Energy Division of the CF. Uh, WMEU. Uh, Stephen has also spent a considerable period of his time in the industry as an industry safety and health rep. Uh, and this is a statutory position, uh, which is very much the, um, the eyes and ears uh, of the workers in regards to health and safety. 
Uh, Stephen spent a lot of his time, unfortunately, uh, reviewing wardens' inquiries in fatal and serious accidents and represents the union on various safety committees and legislative committees uh, around the state, and particularly in the area of coal miners' uh, health and safety. Uh, Stephen's presentation today is titled uh, Where From uh, and What's Next? So welcome, Stephen, to, to the stage. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brett. Uh, I just wanted to first pay my respect to the traditional owners, past, present and emerging on the land we meet today. Um, the presentation I'm going to give um, certainly isn't a technical presentation, nor a um, one about statistics or about data. It's actually about what, what I believe and what the organisation I represent um, believe um, in relation to, I guess, the people will call the rediscovery re-emergence or black lung um, or common workers pneumoconiosis coming back on the scene. So the technical papers have all been delivered and, and they've been great papers. And um, But I always want to touch on, I guess, uh, our journey, the union's journey. Now, there will be aspects of this presentation that some people might find a bit hard to um, accept. Um, it, it may offend some people. Um, it's not a, my presentation is not about that. My presentation is about putting the facts out there on the record. Um, and it's about what we all should be doing collectively, um, putting our efforts together to look after the coal mine worker because they're the most important person. And I think that's been lost at time. So again, I hope that um, the presentation, and I'm not going to key you by, by PowerPoint, <laughs> um, but I hope the presentation uh, is something everyone can take away. I hope it opens up some debate some discussion and um, as I'm always up for a chat further on around that. Firstly, I just want to quickly thank um, Brett and Nikki for the opportunity to present today. And also I just want to broadly, um, prior to the presentation, thank, I guess, uh, people like Dr. Anthony Lynham, his team at the, um, Anthony was obviously the previous um, Mines Minister uh, and his, his team um, for all the work they've done. The HSU, the RSH, you, the work they've done, um, and also just generally some of the medical professionals, academics, and others. And, and I think at the end of it, um, we, we've worked collectively together to get to it, get to a result. Um, sometimes it's been tough. Anyway, I'll kick away with that. Again, I'm not here to bore you with it, but I just want to give a, a set an overview. And, and again, it's the journey of the union. I represent its members and families um, since the reemergence. So I guess again, I'm not a, I'm not either medical regulator involved in government. I'm a representative of workers. Uh, it's, it's something that I pride myself on, and it's an honour to represent workers and their families. Um, but the first question is, how did the disease, which everyone believed was eradicated, suddenly appear after 17 years of no cases, um, if not longer, being diagnosed? And, and I'm basing that off what we do know now of the Rathus report from 1984, and then the reemergence in 2015, give or take. Um, but you'll see along it, uh, there'll be other milestones that have been uncovered. We're in for a shock, you know, and, and I think for us in the mining industry, we actually failed on the basis of risk management and change management, I think. And you'll see the reasons why. We missed the warning signs. Um, we all believed that we had no dust disease. Surely none of us were convinced it suddenly disappeared. The doctors, were they doing their job? Were coal companies had dust levels under control? Was the regulator enforcing the law? Well, what we do know is what we thought was happening was not. In fact, the industry was in a spiral towards the unfolding disasters of coal, for coal mine workers in the Queensland industry. Um, just quickly, that's the Rathus report. It's online. Um, the report actually in 1984 identified uh, a number of pneumoconiosis cases, a number of abnormal results out of 7,907 x-rays. Um, Rathus and Abraham were commissioned by the government back then to do a review of the coal mine workers health scheme. Um, they travelled the length and breadth of Queensland. They undertook 7,907 x-rays. The report's there for people to read. But what was interesting was what they identified and what they found. Uh, the fact that they found back then, one in every 105 coal mine workers had some sort of mine lung dust disease. Uh, they had some suggested recommendations and control measures, including right back at then in 1980, the ILA classifications, the radiographs of pneumoconiosis chest x-rays. Uh, we as an organisation found out 33 years later this report was done and I can only go on from my, ex my time in the role to where we're at now. Um, then what happened between 84 and 2015? 
we are aware that several reviews have occurred. We know 98 of risk assessments undertaken by then the Department of Mines titled Dust and Related Respiratory Disease in Coal Mines. It identified mine and lung dust disease, 83 to 94, 93 to 99, 13 cases. The report also reflects on the issues that Rathos identified with mine is respiratory health and lack of dust controls. But it did note in the report, the poor spirometry of mines at the German Creek Central Underground, the Gunyala Riverside open cut at the time. And out of 913 claims workers comp, only one was for respiratory disease. And for the record, that person received $513. Um, the risk assessment identified a number of control measures and, and they're all there. But what's of interest there is everything they've identified back then, exactly what's come to fruition from 2015 onwards. So what we're saying is from 1984 onwards, we all, we all play a part of this as, as, as stakeholders in the industry. We knew what needed to be there and what, what we all thought was actually there on behalf of the mine workers. And you'll see it there, training, spirometry, doctor supervising tests, proper techniques, calibration of machines, x-rays to standard the ILO, equipment, film, technique, satisfactory standard. They identify then the ILO standard need to be set, a centralized agency, one single operator, but um, done to a standard. So what happened with the risk? What happened with the risk assessment report? As far as I know, um, it was shelved and put on the shelf. Again, what happened? We had a, we had a, a change risk-based legislation, including coal doctors and coal mines allowed to undertake own dust monitoring. Perception is medical professional HSU were undertaking roles and reviews of the X-rays, and again, this has come out of the data and the reports. Again, the failure um, to ensure the 93. Since 93 is compulsory review and grade all x-rays, experience and knowledge of people and disappeared, uh, loss of confidence in the system, mistrust of those who are responsible. And then the mindset that we actually had no dust. We actually eradicated. I remember in 90, 2003, I went to the US and presented at NIOSH and I was proud to stand up and say, we did not have black lung in Australia. We have nailed it. Uh, and people in the room smiled. Um, they didn't say a lot, but obviously, um, they, they weren't as sold as what we were. And we do know that, in fact, again, there's between 120,000 and 150,000 medical assessments and x-rays stored in shipping containers, and there's no central data or processing. Um, we know there's manuals in place. We know that what was required to be done from 93 to 2000. We know that the companies increased from 25 to 260 doctors, and the list goes on. Um, and, and what we miss, you know, we had this all occurring at the same time we're going towards a new legislation we're focusing rightly so on what happened at Mara with spontaneous combustion, with gas monitoring and, and, and the hazards that we knew that actually had killed people. But we also, at the same time, were not looking broader or further afield of what we needed to do in the health, in the health area. Um, and there is a health scheme order in 93, it ran for 10 years. Um, the transitional arrangement ceased. And the health scheme order's there. It poses a lot of questions. Um, and this is what I think, we think as well, that. At the same time, we practically had the we had in coal mines, we had people, environment, equipment, process, and organisations changing. We had production pressure, longer shifts, increased time at the face, lack of supervision, lack of maintenance, poor mine planning, poor work practices, bonus, employment arrangements, contractors, um, the change of statutory officials. Um, and then we went to more efficient machinery, generate more dust. We've heard it from the experts today, higher production, bigger long walls, height length, multiple seams. Increase in silica, churn with the coal seams in mine, methane drainage, deeper mines, more fri friable coal, thicker seams, ventilation, too much, too little, inadequate ventilation, inadequate water suppression, poor operating, damaged equipment, experience of operators, and the list goes on. So I guess what we're saying, and we say as a union reduction in an in, in attempt to de-unionise the industry. And as I said, on the president of the union here speaking today, so people might... Uh, um, not share the view, but I'm just sharing my 33 years in the mining industry. We had all this going on, but at the same time, we had a reduction in monitoring sampling. And we fell into, we've gone to a risk-based legislation. You know, there was things that we were doing, you know, the, the regulator, the government used to have dust inspectors go around, stone dust samplers go around. That disappeared. We went to a self-based risk management type of legislation. Again, how did the industry manage the change it has in the process? People will have different views on that. But what we do know is, and rightly so, we were putting the focus certainly on issues of strata, spontaneous combustion and ventilation, but we didn't seem to be putting it in the same area of restful dust and the issues with, um, with mine dust lung disease. Um, just quickly, I'll run through this because I know it's, it, 
I'm after lunch and everyone's keen for a beer. Um, our journey, 2015, I was contacted by a member to say that he thought he had pneumoconiosis. Um, we had a lengthy discussion with this, this union member. Then later that year, I was fortunate enough to attend the United Mine Workers Convention and attend a black lung seminar. There were speakers there like Cohen and Rose, Dr. Rose. Um, I spoke to them at length about respiratory disease. Um, then after the seminar, an arrangement was made to talk to the United Mine Workers, their OHS department and others about this case in Queensland, Australia. Um, and then after that, uh, arrangement was made that the lawyers that were representing this union member sent the stuff to the US, to the UIC. Um, and then what we know, they did a review and bang, this guy was the first guy diagnosed in 30 years, they say. Um, what we found out of that was he actually was diagnosed in 2000, his x-ray from 2009. Um, he was, uh, what, a 1-1, I think, on the ILO classification, um, but that was missed. Uh, and then as we go through, we find other stuff that happened about monitoring and health assessments. We then wrote to the minister in 2015 and we requested that. Um, and we requested a lot of information. Um, we posed a number of solutions um, and, and we certainly wanted to look at things like how do you get someone from the open cut and they go underground or underground the open cut? How do you track them as about databases? So, and then late 2015, we've seen increased numbers of cases coming forward, in particular Carbara Downs mine. Um, they then made a decision, Andy Valor and Barley owned at the time, to do a full screening of their workforce, which I congratulate them on. They actually engaged the University of Illinois that did a, in line with the company's NMA here, did a full screening. And I think from memory, they ended up with seven people diagnosed with a mine lung dust disease and about 15 or 16 others that were on the, on the um, had some sort of other abnormality, but not, not pneumoconiosis. We then wrote, the ISHRs wrote to industry in 2015. And I've got to say, the response we got back was a generic response, pretty well telling us to storm in a teacup, don't worry about it. All our systems are good. Um, that's fine. Uh, we didn't stop at that, but we continue to press and we took it upon ourselves to engage our membership um, and then to continue to engage in government. And then in early 2015, the Director General wrote to the union firm a number of things we'd asked about with databases and suggested a Monash UIC scope to do a review of the Mine Workers Health Scheme. Um, so that was where it started. And then 2015, the groups the groups formed. 2016, the group, uh, David Cliff actually chaired it, Come On Workers Health Scheme, and away we go. Um, it was very interesting, that group. It was um, involved the stakeholders across the industry. Um, there was a fair bit of, um, I guess, robust discussion at time and debate, but you'd expect that. Um, we welcomed that because it was needed. And I think at times people lost their way because the focus should have been on who were there for the Come On Worker, the families. In the community they're living and that's what we, i keep going back to because that's what i'm that's what i'm about so you'll see in 2016 the minister announced a number of things it's interesting that eight of the 12 underground mines had directives on them from the regulator um and then we started to see that un, unwind the amount what we've seen around dust levels that were i guess accepted by all people that worked at the mine whether it's a long wall production operator or the underground mine manager it became complacency and normal to be working in six eight ten milligrams of coal dust um, and that's type of stuff. And the, this is all the evidence is there. So it's not something we're making up. Um, the initial meeting uh, stalled, but we got the ball rolling. And then um, we also at the same time received a number of uh, pointed letters from, from Ranska, uh, the Royal Australian New Zealand, um, uh, ex, I'll get it right here. Um, Ranska represent the radiologists, sorry. Um, they were a bit, feel, bit, bit uh, cranky with some of the stuff we were putting out there. Uh, we had a number of meetings with them. And then we've seen Senate Select Committee get formed and then we've seen um, other changes. And I think, um, again, I'll congratulate the, hate, the Health Surveillance Unit, the RSHQ and others on the work they've done to get to the point with the, the protections and measures they've put in and building the regulation and that now certainly has is, is come out of the... I guess the campaign and the pushing that, that each and every uh, stakeholder did sometimes in different directions, but to get to the common goal. Um, and as I said, um, they registers were developed for, for readers, interim report comes out, a final report come out with a total of 18 recommendations, two reader process commences, dual read B readers. Um, at this time, the union would have a lot of, would have a lot of ongoing meetings with government and other stakeholders. Um, the Black Lung Victims Group was formed in Queensland. Um, I attended the meeting with them. We actually met with the, with the Premier. That was where the 10 cent per tonne 
on coal produced was um, put forward as a as a levy, and I tell you what, they got some action um, because as soon as you, it, it actually triggered a response, and it's the response that was wanted that that we thought that the taxpayer of Queensland shouldn't be paying for a legacy issue and shouldn't be paying for the workers' comp. This industry should be paying and we need to be working through it. So out of that come a lot of good recommendations. That's when we started the push reduction dust level. Um, we then got a letter from the QRC saying we do not support the 10 cent a ton, 10 cent a ton levy. That, that's fine. Um, we had workers, members of ours at different mines starting to push back, starting to do things in the workplace or, and there are concerns for the health and safety around dust. And we also had um, some rallies here in Brisbane that were well attended. Then the minister announced a, par the minister announced a parliamentary inquiry called, uh, well, Black Lung White Lies was the final report. Um, there was a number of recommendations in that. Um, but what, at the same time, we'd pose some questions back through to the health surveillance unit around the review of the um, component, respiratory component of the coal mine workers health scheme in September. Because what we identified that, that there was actually 18 people that potentially had CWP or mine lung dust disease. And then we identified with spirometry there, 30 out of 256 had abnormalities and then 24 possible restricted diseases. So we wanted to know what's the follow-up, what's the close out? How do you follow it through? Um, the black lung victims groups continue to meet on their own. We continue to, to advocate to reduce dust levels. Uh, we had issues with some of the radiologists and the NMAs. Um, at the same time, we're engaged with our union here, our ISHRs. Uh, Joe Main was the main head administrator for United for MSHA in the US under an Obama administration, our, our ISHRs attended NIOSH and MSHA to get some more understanding around the PDM 3700, the dust levels and other measures. 2017, we started to see real change. There's changes for health assessments. And again, uh, the regulator and through the RSHQ and HSU have pushed this. Um, a lot of change, and I've got to say, I think in hindsight, a lot of change occurred at a rate that's probably unheard of. Um, particularly in the mining sector, but but within the jurisdiction. Um, we know in the US it's taken, four, in some cases, 40 years to get to a point to, to discuss certain things in the coal sector, but reform was happening. Um, and then the, it goes through uh, new imaging standards were established for x-ray standards, training, and continued. Um, dual reader was put in, confirmed cases continue to rise. First B reader course in December 2017, established to recognise standards in that. And, and um, I know the inspector spoke about this morning, there's two recognised standards there, monitoring restful coal dust and mines and underground restful dust control. And there's been work done around the surface one. So there's a lot of good work's gone into that. Clinical pathway was developed for the power stations. It's quite interesting. There's been two cases of dust disease in the power generators. Um, and OIR, which is uh, obviously industrial relations have developed a a, uh, a clinical pathway plus a um, guideline within that sector, build off the coal sector, code of practice. Um, we've had the web portal set up, um, MONA, the Miners Health Portals. Um, return to Work Group was formed, and that I've got to say that's probably the first time we've finally landed at a position now where there's a set of guidelines for, to determine the severity of someone that's got a mine lung dust disease to potentially be able to return to work. That was a demonstration of working within the stakeholders to come to an end position where people may be able to return to work because pe the, the prevalent or sorry the resistance there was for a mine worker to participate in a scheme where they lose their job they don't want to do that they're happy to go to the next x-ray and be kicked out of the industry so we need to do something to say well we want you to come forward we want you to participate we want you to be a part of it but we also want to give you a future in fact if you do have a a mine lung dust disease, um, a guide, and this guideline's been done now. Um, it's, it's one of its first, I believe, particularly in the mining sector, is in terms of severity. It looks at the hot, it looks at everything from um, the screening all the way through to the level, dust level in the workplace, um, how you can monitor. So that's that's come into place. Um, regulatory change come in. Dust level started then to be reduced in 2018. Um, as a union yourself, what we've done here in Australia, we've actually been able to provide and send around the world um, through all the coal mining unions around the globe. Uh, we attended a meeting in India where we had every mining country there other than Russia. And I think that's because the Ukraine was there at the time. They decided not to come. But um, we were able to spend a day on this issue of, of, of um, health um, screening. And it was quite interesting to see in, in countries like Pakistan and elsewhere where um, you know, they struggle to get a dust mask. 
they still wear a rag over their mouth. They, um, it, it's just ironic and just terrific to see some of them countries, uh, what they do. And they have quite a large mining. I was surprised the size of the mining sector in Pakistan is quite large. Uh, India and elsewhere. So there's a lot of work we've been able to do here in Queensland and Brace and send around the world and, and help, help those guys and girls. And we continue to this day as late as last week, we, we, we donated money to the Pakistan Union to hold their first safety conference so that they can talk about health and safety, but also some of the stuff around screening. And then, so that's what we continue to do. Um, there is dates there. 2019, mobile screening service was announced. So it's 2021 and it's finally coming to fruition, which is certainly welcome. And I know our organisation and our members advocated hard and long for that. And, and we certainly will keep our eye on it and want to be a part of it moving forward. We held our own dust conference on the Gold Coast in 2020, which was remarkable, bringing unions, academics, um, lawyers, uh, regulators from around the world. And we got some good outcomes out of that. And as we've seen in July, dust, again, the some recommendations to boost dust levels. Um, that started to occur in August. The levels are there. The recognised standards were reviewed to reflect that. And, and again, in 2020, we've seen um, what I think is a great thing is the mine safety and health quarry, sorry, and non-coal sector um, look at doing what we've done in coal. I've got a longer transitional period, but it's certainly welcome. Uh, and then we, 2020, what's of interest is the mine, miners health, sorry, uh, H, high resolution CT scan review done. Um, we raised some issues at the time around what we thought was where a person was being di potentially diagnosed or through a screening on, on x-ray and then he, had to go, he or she goes through the clinical pathway and they're doing a CT scan and cleared and then we'll find out later on they actually were diagnosed with CWP for a mind lung dust disease. So we asked and it was undertaken uh, a review of the CT scans and, and there was some recommendations that come out of that. They found some stuff, including uh, you know, a protocol to employ the similar process by the plain chest as they do now, um, that you double read the CT scan with a, with a um, B reader. Now, that's still a work in progress, but that was certainly, there's full recommendations out of that. But again, it's about that continuous improvement. Once you identify something, bring it to the fore and, and dealing with it. Um, and as I said, eight, April 21, we've actually written to the HSU and we've had discussions. Um, what we've seen is a upward trend of COPD cases in the, in the coal sector. Uh, and look, I'll be perfectly blunt here. We, we said, in our view, and again, it comes into three things, either the failure to follow the clinical pathway, unknowingly on purpose, the relevant medical professional inability to determine and treat MDLD, or approach by some ANAs or other health professionals not to report what the relevant employer wishes. Now, that triggered a response. Um, what, what really gets under our skin is that you've got people are being diagnosed in the workplace with a COPD, but they're saying the causal agents in the workplace, yet they've got silicosis or pneumoconiosis. I don't know where they get it. Um, you could argue about the emphysema or others, but but come on. So it's still one of the things that I think still needs to be explored a bit more. And I'm aware of about 225 cases of COPD now that have um, come through, have been reported on the Form 1A. Um, and again, for that, the concern we had was there was people that were sitting on the stakeholders group um, for the clinical pathway to return people to work. But the same people then were saying to people, no, you can't you just can't work and the causal agent isn't the workplace or, or what they're exposed to in that silicosis and pneumoconiosis. So there's a lot of work to be done on that still. Um, again, we touched on the clinical pathway. Uh, and I guess what, what's next? And I'll hurry up. So the next steps are this. We acknowledge the massive amount of work undertaken by the stakeholders over the last six years. It's been challenging and frustrating at times. There was a lot of pushback at times and non-acceptance. Um, there's a lot of debate, a lot of meetings, a lot of, a lot of campaigning. Um, and, and look, we had questions um, that we posed a lot at. Uh, we had a vision, we had a plan, we got an end goal. But it's all based on fixing something. It's based on fixing a broken system for mine workers and their families. The union's view is this. Still require independent medical professionals, doctors and specialists. We don't support companies having coal mine doctors. This has to change. The union acknowledges the work undertaken by the health surveillance unit and the regulation changes. But for us, the next steps are requirements of true independence. The same with the dust monitoring. It needs to be done and stand alone, independent system. We, the employer must monitor for the dust. That's got to happen. But you want, we believe there should be an independent group there, Simtars. We put this out there. Or a group that does the independent, turns up unannounced and does that on the job. The mobile health units needs to be a standalone process. Without the, the influence of company doctors, the framework needs to be finalised. Also, the revol resolving of the current co uh, COPD issue in the mining sector. One OSHR alone 
has had 225 cases reported to him in just over 12 months. Now, again, there's 225 cases. There's obviously a clinical pathway to follow. But in saying that, you can't tell me all the 225 are not work-related or the causal agents does not work, particularly if it's silicosis or pneumoconiosis. Again, I'm not a doctor, but um, there's a lot of processes we put in. Now, in closing, this is what, in closing, about halfway through, through this journey, one of our members wrote this, wrote this to me, and I think I'll share it. Um, I want to share it. And you've got to remember, this is halfway through it. He said this, the union believes that the companies, department, doctors have had their chance. The regulators failed to deal with black lung, allowing its re-emergence and companies and operators have effectively been left to self-regulate. And of course, this has been done and that has also been a disastrous failure. Clearly, these approaches have not worked and has been a catastrophic failure to ensure that those who place trust in the system, those workers at the coalface relying on others to do the right thing have been massively let down and the consequences of that are plain. If the coal workers have risked life on a limb and then families just suffer the consequences of failures. Their livelihoods are put at risk, and as we've seen, many are paid dearly. For years, multinationals have been allowed to put commercial interests and excessive production demands ahead of safety with entirely inadequate, ineffective regulatory oversight. These commercial interests can no longer be permitted to have influence over the monitoring process. The union believes a medical professional have contributed to the problem, and the union can be trusted to protect the health and safety of workers. That was said to us by a member halfway through this. Um, obviously, a lot of water's gone under the bridge, but. In summing up, um, from, from our perspective, uh, we still think there's a fair bit of work to be done. I thank the opportunity to, to give a presentation. I said it's not illegal or technical, but it's a journey we've been on, and I think it's um, certainly an opportunity to, to put it, the place in on the record, and um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Great, Steve. Great presentation, and uh, gets right to the heart of the matter. Now, any questions for Steve? I'm always happy to take a call after hours or offline. Seriously. Gonna... So, Steve, uh, thanks again. Uh, it's, uh, it, as I said, brings the, um, the whole uh, matter of um, uh, lung disease uh, back to what's relevant, and that's the guys working at the face uh, and being subjected to it. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, an excellent presentation, and thank you very much. So, you cheers. have two quick questions oh. online, yep. if we've got time. Yep, we've got time. Uh, so Will O'Callaghan is asking, why are you recommending for independent dust monitoring? Is there issues with transparency of results? Certainly is, because we're seeing where, and we've, we've got examples and evidence of where an employee will say, come in and do the dust sampling day and they're on a long wall move, or they're on a maintenance day. Uh, and, and those factors, I think in, I think a company should welcome an independent because then it verifies their results, similar to what MSHA does in the US. And, and it's something that we used to do that we drifted away from. Thanks, got two more questions. Janine Lees is asking, how can we access the RTW guide that Stephen discussed? I believe it's, on, I can check, but I think it's on the um, OIR website, but I can confirm if not, um, I, I'm pretty sure it is actually. And Ross Mills asks, there was some good information there, or is, that's just a thank you for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Britt. Good on you, Steve. Are you just going to fix it up for us? Okay, thanks, Connor. Um, folks, uh, it's been a really informative day. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, first of all, I must apologise to each of the uh, presenters um, for the fact that the, the screens didn't work uh, or the blinds didn't work and therefore um, a lot of what was on the screen at stages uh, couldn't be seen. So uh, we will be distributing um, the presentations and there has been a recording done um, of the day for, for that will be available to everybody that's either been online or been here. So uh, again, um, apologies to the presenters and to the people here in the room. I'd like to thank the pre presenters today for the high quality of the presentations and the content that, they, that has been made available. A lot of it is emerging research uh, and therefore um, the researchers uh, are getting it out there as soon as they possibly can. 
Um, and then uh, the last presentation, uh, Stephen brought it right back home as to this is all about people who are working in, not only in the mines, but the quarries and, and other industries uh, where it's been highlighted that dust disease is affecting uh, people and, and they're not being protected adequately. Um, I'd like to um, thank and acknowledge RSHQ uh, for their ongoing support for this forum, uh, particularly Dean Barr, who's um, uh, co-hosted today. And um, also I'd like to thank um, uh, Drager and Melissa Pender for um, helping to sponsor the event uh, to make sure it can run. Uh, special thanks to my team at, uh, uh, at MISC uh, for helping put this together and um, specifically to, to Nikki LeBranch. Uh, congr congratulations on today's success. Um, your immense efforts uh, have obviously been well worth it. Uh, good luck for the next couple of days or weeks. Uh, one more um, presentation to go, so uh, you need to hang in there. The success of uh, this event continues to grow. Um, the last two years we've had in the order of uh, 100 people present and some 400 people online. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to next year, actually. It should be a cracker if we can finally get a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, uh, it'll be fantastic. And uh, I think um, that stresses the importance uh, of where uh, the research and the application of the research back to the mine sites uh, needs to be done with the attendance that continues uh, to happen. Uh, thank you again uh, for those um, that were here or online. Uh, and um, just finally, uh, please join me for some um, close to the end of the year celebratory drinks and, and uh, celebrate the success of today. Um, please travel safe and uh, I hope to see you again uh, next year. Thank you very much.